interact with today's stream, use the Slido chat to the right of your screen. Downloadable resources are also available during and after the lesson. everybody and welcome to the second of our Science Farm Live 2023 lessons. I am Jenny and I'm so excited to welcome you all here to the Grey Sheep Company where we have got an absolutely action-packed lesson for you today. Today we are going to be learning all about wool, we are going to be learning all about the features of wool and we are going to be learning all about the uses of wool that range from the very bottom of the seabed all the way to outer space. I cannot wait to get started and to introduce you to our first guest and it's the first guest of many. We've got so much going on in this lesson for you today but what I'd like you to do now before we get going is I'd like you to have a think and a chat in your classes what are the features or the properties of wool that you already know about. Let me know in the word cloud and I'm going to go and find Susie the shepherdess. I'll see you in a minute.
dancers, everybody. Well done. So I am so excited that Susie the Shepherdess is here with us. Thank you so much for being with us today, Susie. You're welcome. So we are now going to track the journey of wool right from the very beginning. So Susie, can you tell us what is wool and where does it come from? Wool is a fantastic natural fibre that's grown on the backs of sheep and they're continuously growing it all year round and we harvest it by shearing the sheep. By shearing the sheep. Yeah. And why do we shear sheep? What, what's, um, how does it help them? Um, we shear for welfare reasons as much as anything um, because their wool is growing continuously. It doesn't ever stop. So if you didn't shear them, mm. then they would end up like massive fluff balls and it would be heavy for them, difficult for them to move around. You've also got the problems of things like blue bottles will lay their eggs onto the fleece and then oh. they hatch out into little maggots which then burrow down and eat the sheep's skin. Oh my and obviously goodness. if it's got a lot of fleece on there it can't itch or get them out and it'll end up eventually killing the sheep. So. Oh wow, so it's really, really important, really important to yes, keep them to healthy that. Yes. that we have to do it. Yeah. Okay, I understand. And I've heard as well that it's kind of like it, it, the, the sheep could overheat in the summer, can't they? If they've got like a really heavy heavy coat? No, that's not really true. Obviously, you want to okay. keep them comfortable, but wool is such a fantastic insulator. It insulates against the heat as well as the cold. Oh, wow. So if you had a, a really hot day and you had a freshly shorn sheep that had just a tiny bit amount of wool on its back compared to one that had a year's growth, yeah. it would, the freshly shorn sheep would find the heat a lot more than the, the one with wool because it's got no protection there and, and that's why wool is such a fantastic natural product. Yes, oh, that's amazing. And we are going to come, out, come on to that later on in the lesson. We're going to learn more about the insulation properties of wool. That's so interesting. So I guess that's why we're shearing now in spring, because it it's is. not too hot and it's not too cold. So it's yeah. a good time to do it. It's an ideal time to start shearing the sheep in the springtime. And um, I don't know if you're interested, but Florence in here looks like she needs a haircut. So um, if you'd like to see how it's done, I'm happy to do a little demo. For you. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to see Florence getting her haircut. I don't know about everyone else, but I think I would definitely like to see a live sheep shearing. Oh, how exciting. Okay, so if you want to go and get Florence ready, um, everybody, if you could have a guess, see if you can tell me, where, how long do you think it will take Susie to shear this sheep? How long do you t think it will take for Florence to get her hair cut? And then we'll come back and we'll hopefully see it in action. Let's go. Okay, welcome back everybody. As you can see, Florence is here and she is lying down ready for her haircut. So off you go, Susie, if you want to uh, show us what okay, you do. Okay, yeah. And can you tell us what, can you talk us through it? I'll talk yeah. you through it as yeah. I go. I'll have to speak up because it's a little bit noisy. So the first thing I'm going to do, I start high up on the brisket and I'm going to take all the belly wool off. So we, we shear the belly wool off because she's been let down on it all year. As you can see, it's quite mucky compared to the rest of the fleece. So I'm just going to shear that all off in one piece. And then I cut that to one side. And I'm just going to go down her back legs and see the cracks here. So I'm using my spare hand to keep the skin nice and tight. 
so that the clippers don't cut into her. Okay, so that was going to be my next question actually, Susie. She looks very comfortable, she looks very calm. Is, does this hurt the sheep at all? No, so it's just like getting your hair cut. Oh um, my goodness, so it is just like a haircut. It's just running over the top of the skin. I'm not yeah. hurting her. No. And I don't know if you saw earlier, but I'm wearing moccasins on my feet. Oh so, wow. Because I'm putting my feet underneath the sheet to hold her. I'm just going to give her a little top knot a cut here. Um, it means it's nice and comfy. If my feet are underneath her, she's not going to struggle too much. So I'm just coming up the neck now. Just to open that out. Florence is being so good, isn't she? Yeah, so they don't mind being shorn, you know, and they get used to it. If it's uh, the um, first time they've had it done, they might struggle a little bit. Yeah, but, but she's, they get I used guess... to it because they get it done every year. And she trusts you and she knows what it's for and she knows it will make her more comfortable. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I'm handling her properly. The way that I hold her, she thinks that she can't get up. So she's not going to try and struggle. Yeah. So we're just going to keep her as comfortable as possible. And I'm just moving her around so I can get to the different areas. Well done, Florence. You are being very, very and calm and patient. Long legs because we're going all the way up the sheep, right from the back. Before I start to come down the other side. So I'm just going beyond her spine there. A step up. Give her a little trim up round her face. And then I start to go down the other side. So I'm just putting her head back so it stretches all this skin nice and tight. I'm just under her armpit here to take one to the armpit. And then I'm just finishing off coming down the last side here. Now over the back leg. I'm just going to pop her head forward so you can all see her. Pull that skin tight. And then these are just the last few blows. Get that fleece off. And as you can see, it's all come off in one fleece. Oh my goodness. Okay. Wow, she's like a completely different sheep. Oh, well done, Florence. You were so good. So I cannot believe how quickly you did that, Susie. That was far quicker than when I get my hair cut. I hope everybody had a good go at guessing how long it was going to take. How far away were you? How close were your guesses? So we've got all of this wonderful fleece and it looks so, so fluffy. I don't know if you can see how fluffy it is, everybody, but it looks really, really fluffy. Um, but it doesn't look like the wool that we buy in the shops, does it? So what needs to happen next? Well, the, the start of the process is the first thing it happens is it leaves the farm and it goes off to get uh, scoured, which is the washing process to remove all the lanolin, which is the oil that protects the sheep that's in the wool and any of the dirt. And then it comes back to the mill on the farm, okay. which is just next door. And Emma's in there. If you'd like to go and see her, we can talk you through the processes from changing it from the, the fleece as it comes off the sheep's back through to the end product ready to make jumpers or rope or amazing yes i would love to go and see that absolutely okay everybody while i walk next door and while we put florence back uh back into her little into her little house um can you have a go at filling the word cloud with all of the different uses for wool that you already know about how many can you think of and then we're going to go and see what happens when it is processed off we go
Okay, everybody, I've popped next door now to the spinning mill and I'm here with Emma. So thank you very much for meeting with me today, Emma. It's a pleasure. Um, so can you tell us, after the fleece has been washed, what needs to happen next? Well, it comes back to us like this. And to be honest, it's a little bit like bedhead. Okay, so when you wake up in the morning and your hair's all scruffy and it's all over the place. A little bit tangled. Yeah. And the fibres are all going in all sorts of directions, a little bit like my frizzy hair. Yeah, and mine. Yeah. So the first process um, we're looking at is the carding process, and it's almost like giving it the first hairbrush of the day. Okay. And it's basically starting to pull the fibres apart and straighten them okay. so that we can actually get it in, all in the same direction so we can spin it. Just like brushing hair. So we've seen what it looks like before it goes in the machine. Should we get the camera to get a close up of what it looks like when it comes out the machine? That'd be a good idea. And then there's, there are a couple more machines to look at as well. Yeah, absolutely. There. So can you show me those? Yes, of course. Brilliant, let's go. Wow, wasn't that amazing? So, Emma, where are we now? So, we're at the machine and it's called a pin drafter. Pin drafter, okay. So, this is what we had from the back of the carding machine. So, it looks like a sausage, it's called a roving. And basically, as you can see, it's still all quite matted. Mm. So, now the pin drafter is our take on hair straighteners. So, okay. this, is the, this is the main machine that's going to straighten all the fibres. Um, and um, allow us to then go on to the spinning machine. Okay. And the way it does that is, can you see, we've got all these rows of combs. It's quite lethal. Loads of combs in there, yeah. Can everyone see? And then the, the fibre comes from the back, through the combs, and into this drum here. Oh wow, and it's a lot sleeker and it's a lot more smooth yes. when it comes out. So if we look at it, this is how it comes out of the pin drafter. And this is, could you hold that there for me, Jenny? And I'll just yeah, show. no problem. So when you look at this, this is all, all the fibers are going in the same direction now, which allows us to spin it. So it's a little bit like cotton wool, this one, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Whereas this is much more sort of, you can, see, you can start seeing all the fibers so we can draw them out and start spinning them. But maybe we should have a look at this working. Yes, yes, show us. Okay, right, I'm just going to shut the cover and we'll get it going. Okay, and then you can take me to the next machine. Fantastic. So now we're at the final stage, what's happening here? Well, as we saw, the fibre from the pin drafter goes at the back of the machine yep. and comes on over. And this, to me, is like the Midas thing. This is turning all that wacky, frizzy fluff into something really useful. Uh -huh. So you can see that the fibre comes down here and it comes down onto these rollers. And we have two sets of rollers. The first set starts to pull the fibre out thinner because okay. we don't want we spun that it'd be way too thick yeah and then there's another set of um, rollers here which pull it even thinner and we get this thin wow strand of um, fiber coming through gosh it goes from this this thick all the way down to something as fine as this absolutely wow and then this is the spindle on here which the, the yarn's being spun onto and this twists round at speed okay so it's actually this part that's putting the twist into the fibre that's helping all those fibres stay together. Mm -hmm. So it's going from the straight to a twisted and then the ring bar here is going up and down and um, is loading the spindle and we can see that once I turn the machine on. Oh my goodness, yes, let's, let's turn on the machine and see it in action.
Wasn't that amazing, everybody? We have just learned how wool goes from the back of the sheep all the way through these fantastic machines until it becomes this soft fiber that we can use to make uh, garments like Emma's jumper and like my jumper. But that's not all wool can do, is it? No, absolutely not. And so we are now gonna learn all about those other really, really exciting uses. And our first step to learning about those was when we went to visit the Bedworth Fire Station a couple of weeks ago. So let's have a look at that video and see what we got up to. I'm here at Bedworth Fire Station, which is part of Warwickshire Fire and Rescue Service, to find out about one of the uses of wool. And I'm here with Bex. Morning, Hello. Bex. Morning. And we're going to be looking at something called PPE that firefighters use on a daily basis while fighting fires. So, Bex, can you tell me a little bit about your PPE? Right, so PPE is personal protective equipment. So what I'm wearing is a tunic and leggings. Um, and what that is designed to do is to protect firefighters from um, various hazards. So things like chemicals and um, biological hazards such as um, blood. Um, but more importantly, the day-to-day -day stuff, the um, smoke and fire. So when we are going into buildings or if we're firefighting outside, um, our PPE is designed to um, stop us really from being covered in smoke and, and um, also stop us from being burned by fire. That sounds like a very important part of your role and also an important piece of equipment that you have with you all the time. Indeed. But I bet all of you in your classrooms or at home are wondering how on earth that has got anything to do with wool and the sheep we've seen so far in the lesson. Right, okay. So. Wool is one of the parts of our fi uh, firefighting equipment, so actually it's um, the base layer um, so to our inside, PPE. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's on the inside. So that's why you might not be able to see it, because it's actually on the inside, and it does have a really, really important job, though, in our PPE. Fantastic. And what is its role within the PPE? So the role within the PPE is it acts as insulation, insulation. for us. So it's an insulator. Yeah. Can you tell me what an insulator is? What's the insulation? Why do you need insulation in PPE? So um, the insulator does two jobs, really, really important jobs. When it's really cold, if we're out at a road traffic collision, it ke helps keep us warm. Great. But equally, um, if we are at a fire, it can actually um, help us stay that little bit cooler. Um, so when we're uh, having to fight fires and you, we want not to be burned, we have to wear this and it does help um, keep us cool um, when we're fighting fire. That's amazing. So it's a material, as an insulator, it can both keep you protected from heat and also protected from cold, all through the fact that it doesn't conduct heat. So yeah. no heat can come in and no heat, no goes heat out. can come out either. That's yeah. perfect. Amazing part of your equipment. But I'm sure we had a little chat about this already this morning when I got to the fire station. There's some other really cool materials inside your PPE. There can you is. tell us about them? Yeah, so one of the materials is Kevlar. So that is the um, material that gets used for bulletproof vests. Wow. Yeah, so woven within the outside of our um, PPE is Kevlar. And that um, gives the kit some strength, but it also um, provides additional protection from, fi from fire. Fantastic. So actually the PPE that Bex uses is made up from a range of materials, each chosen for some really useful properties and they work together to keep firefighters safe, doing such an important job, keeping us safe every single day. So that's absolutely fantastic. Now, there's one other thing as well that I've learned recently, which okay. blew my mind. Yep. I heard that wool is also being used to fight fires in space. Yes, um, so really closely woven wool um, is now being used as part of filters that go into respirators for firefighters in space. Fantastic. So, and I've heard that that's been used on the Orion space mission. So I think we're going to see some wool on the moon within the next couple of years. And Absolutely. of course that must be really helpful for firefighters as well as they develop new technology yep. using wool again to protect them on a daily basis using that such a fantastic material that we've come, seen come off a sheep this morning which is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Thank you Bex so much for having us this morning. Not a problem at all. And absolute pleasure. Hopefully we'll see some more wool being used in different ways as we carry on the lesson. Back to the studio, everyone.
Wow, I don't know about you everybody, but until I started researching this lesson, I did not know that the same material that is used to make our woolly jumpers is actually the same material that's keeping firefighters and astronauts safe. Isn't that amazing? So we're going to talk a little bit more about wool in space in a minute, but first let's talk a little bit more about some of the scientific terminology that we just heard on that clip from Bedworth Fire Station. So what I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to have a chat in your classrooms, have a little think and let me know in the word cloud, what do you understand by the term thermal conductor? What do you think those words mean? Have a guess. If you don't know, it doesn't matter because in 90 seconds we're going to come back together and we're going to talk about it. Off you go. Wow, okay, so let's have a look at some of these answers. So it's saying conduct heat, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, uh, let's heat pass through, amazing, brilliant. Something that keeps you warm, mm, okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, brilliant, really good answers, everybody. I can see I have got some materials experts on this lesson already, well done. So uh, the definition of a thermal conductor, a thermal conductor is a material that lets heat pass through through it. So an example of thermal conductors are metals, most metals are thermal conductors, um, and objects that need to transfer heat are often made out of metals, so, such as saucepans and radiators, they are examples of thermal conductors, they allow heat to pass through them. So some of, the, some of you on that, on that word card there, you were giving me the definition of something else, but I'm going to ask this question now, what is a thermal insulator. So we know what a conductor is now. What do you think a thermal insulator is? Have a chat, pop your answers in the word cloud and we'll come back together in 90 seconds.
Okay, so let's have a look at those answers. So something that blocks heat, brilliant, keeps heat in, keeps the heat in, doesn't let heat through it. Amazing. Well done, everybody. So the definition of a thermal insulator is, as lots of you have said, it's the complete opposite to a thermal conductor. So an insulator does not conduct heat and it doesn't let heat pass through it. And wool is a fantastic insulator. And um, um, thermal insulators like wool are really useful materials to help us control heat. And it can do that in two different ways. So as Susie was saying earlier, the fleece of a sheep helps to trap its body heat and keeps it warm in the winter. Um, but also it works in a different way in the summer. It helps to protect the sheep from heat so that it doesn't overhe overheat in the summer. And as we've just seen from Bex at the fire station, her, her, her protective clothing works in a very similar way. So when a firefighter is out in a cold environment, it helps uh, trap that heat inside, trap their body, body heat inside and keeps them warm. But then it also, when they're fighting fires in, in a really warm environment, it helps to, stop, to protect them from heat and stops them from overheating exactly the same as with the sheep. So the same material, the same thermal insulator can do those two two jobs, which is really, really clever. So we also heard about how wool is being used in a, in a respirator on the Orion spacecraft. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So on your screen now, you should see some examples of respirators. So a respirator is a piece of kit. It's something that stops the person wearing it from breathing in harmful gases or harmful uh, particles. Um, and the way that it does that, it, it filters or it catches the harmful materials before the person has a chance to breathe them in. So it lets the oxygen flow through, they can still breathe, breathe normally, but it just traps and stops that, those harmful substances from getting to them. And this is especially important in firefighting because when, when materials are burning, they release some of the most harmful gases and particles that we know about. Um, and so it's really important for fighting fires on, um, on Earth as well as in space. But in space, there's an added, as a, an added consideration. So on Earth, after a fire has been extinguished, all of those harmful particles, those gases and, um, and those harmful substances, they can eventually float away into the atmosphere and we don't breathe them in. But in space, like when we're on an, air, on an aeroplane, the air is all trapped inside the spacecraft and so it can't escape. So even after a fire has been put out, the astronauts can still be breathing in all of those harm, harmful particles, harmful gases that have been released by the fire and created during the firefighting for much longer. So it's really important that, uh, that we have really, really good respirators for astronauts. Um, and so the clever scientists at Lamaco have created um, a filter out of wool and they've used this for they've decided to use wool for two reasons. So the first reason is because wool can be really tightly woven so that it can catch even microscopic particles and stop them from reaching the astronaut, stop them from being breathed in. But also um, wool, another property of wool is that it has a really high, a high much higher melting point than synthetic or man-made materials such as plastic. So this means it's more resistant to heat. So when um, the particles that are created from the fire and from fighting the fire are going to be very hot and if they get in the respirator they can damage that filter and make it not work properly and protect the astronaut as well. So that's why having a heat resistant material in that filter is really important and that's a, just another I think, really cool example of wool. So wool um, is so that we've, we've learned about lots of properties of wool, but we are not done yet, everybody. I uh, can see she's just walking towards me in this little wool studio that we've made here. I have got two more speakers that I want to introduce you to. So our first one is Kate. Kate is a sheep farmer, but she's also an inventor. So Kate, Thank you very much for being here with us today. Can you tell us what did you invent? Yeah, so I took yarn made by people like Emma that you've seen earlier and I made it into wool rope. Wool rope, okay, okay. so tell us, why did you do that? 
Well, I was asked if you could make rope out of wool and I had no idea and so I was really curious and when I made it we realised that there's loads of opportunities for this um, rope to replace plastic and one um, exciting area is in aquaculture in the seaweed industry. Oh, stop there Kate, don't give us, give us any spoilers, there actually that's our next speaker who's going to be talking about that as well. So there's a little hint about where we're going after this. Okay, so, so what are the benefits of replacing the traditional plastic rope with your wool rope? Yeah, so we, there's two points to it really is one we obviously have um, quite a pollution problem with plastic rope mm -hmm. it takes 30 to 40 years to degrade mm -hmm. and then while it's degrading it's um, a challenge for our marine life we have a ghost gear but also it creates lots of little microplastics that yeah. get into our food chain yeah but what we, the brilliant thing about it is wool is that we know it's fully biodegradable it will degrade in about three to four months so if it becomes lost it's not a problem to our environment wow. and when we finished using it in wherever we put it we can bring it back on land as a fertilizer and it can go back to its original components and so we have a circular economy with it that is absolutely amazing so you're replacing something that takes years and years to to break down um, that's that, that creates pollution and creates all sorts of problems in the, in the ocean with a totally natural fiber to, that does exactly the same jobs as the plastic doesn't it and it's um, and it's totally natural fiber that will that will biodegrade and be gone in a matter of months mm -hmm. and it will actually benefit the environment kate has anyone ever done this before no um i don't think so we set the company up called sustainable rope and we sell um wool rope commercially now and it's really exciting the different industries that are getting in touch that want to use it absolutely amazing this is this rope here this is the future i'm i'm just so excited by this project and this leads us on seamlessly to our next speaker so we've already uh we've already seen a little bit of my friend josh when we filmed at the bedworth fire station a couple of weeks ago but he's actually right now he is live on the Sussex coast with our next speaker who is called Steve and he is doing an absolutely fascinating project using Kate's wool rope. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go down to the Sussex coast, we're going to go, go to our beach camera and we're going to find out more about that. Let's go. Good morning everybody, good morning Jenny. I am in Lansing in Sussex and it's a fantastically exciting place because I am here with Steve who is working on, frankly, an amazing project. Steve, tell us me a little bit about what you do and tell all the students watching at school. Yeah, so for the students watching at school, uh, this is a kelp restoration project here in Sussex. Uh, we've lost 97% of our Sussex kelp. It's a keystone species for all the marine life to kind of live around. Um, so this kelp restoration project is basically to bring the kelp back into the sea so the marine life benefit from it. Fantastic, and is there any other benefits from that? Yeah, there's like um, the, the plants themselves absorb more CO2 than trees do. So therefore, if you put more kelp back in there, you're turning the seabed into an underwater forest. That's absolutely amazing. But you might not know that this underwater forest starts life back at Steve's house where he's got his very own kelp hub and is growing the kelp himself. And I was lucky enough this morning to go and have a look at that kelp hub and see where it all begins. Let's go and have a quick look. Okay everyone, so we are in the kelp hub, which is where this all begins. Steve, tell me a little bit about the process that's going on here. Yeah, so the process that's going on here, we're growing the young sporophytes, the little kelps. Um, and this sort of nursery here where we're growing them all is where we're going to grow thousands of little plants to put back out to sea. And Fantastic. this plant here is a fully grown kelp which has dried out, picked it off yeah. the beach. And if I flip it round the other end, which is the hold fast, so this bit here will grab onto the seabed. Fantastic. And it will grow like that and sway around wow. in the water. And this end here is where you get cuttlefish eggs, they hatch their eggs onto this. Um, and then like grey eggs, dogfish eggs, all those things that you see on the TV, um, a lot of marine life will plant their eggs onto Fantastic. this side here. So you're actually building a habitat then for all this marine life to live in? Yeah, bring, building a habitat to bring back the marine biodiversity of our coastline. And these plants here are a keystone species, so they're, they're designed to kind of create the habitat for the marine life to, to kind of hang out in. Amazing. And how do you check that the 
little sporophytes. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's a great right, new yeah. bit of vocabulary today are growing in the in the hub. Yeah, so you can see through the naked eye, like you can actually see the sporophytes growing off the wall rope, which is this stuff here. Um, and on these eight tanks below us, just here, there's loads of wall rope, and the little sporophytes are growing off it. Fantastic, great stuff. Right. We're gonna go down back to the beach now and we'll see you there. Wow, wasn't the kelp hub absolutely amazing? So we're actually now down here on the beach for the next stage of what happens as part of the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project. So, Steve, you've got your sporophytes, they're ready, you've got them on a wall rope. What's the next step? The next step is to put my fins on and swim out and put them out to sea. So basically it's a bit, bit of like a rewilding project, like what you do in your back garden, you might want to put in some bulbs or grow a tomato plant, something like that. This is actually growing sporophytes out to sea, turning the seabed into a kelp forest. Fantastic, so they grow up to that big size we saw in the hub, didn't we? Yeah. They, they grow, and how fast yeah. do they grow when they're out there? They're one of the fastest growing sort of algae you can get. So they, they will grow very quickly. And that's a nice thing. When I go and film them all, um, you'll see them from the sort of early stages. And like any plant on land, you'll better see them grow and grow and grow. So yeah. It's absolutely amazing. So we're really lucky this morning. Steve is gonna go up and check up on some of the kelp that he's already planted. And he's gonna take a camera with him so that you guys can have a little sneaky peek of how well this project is working. So Steve, would you mind heading down into the sea and we'll have a look and we'll go back to the studio yeah. and we'll catch up with you in a couple of minutes when you're out there. So for now everyone, bye bye and back to the studio. Wow, that is such an incredible project. That is just, I cannot believe that those kelp plants that Steve is growing, they, and they, they can absorb more carbon than trees can. I just, you just, it's, it's just such an exciting project and he's using your rope to do it. That must be such a good feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's great to see it. I, it's just, yeah, it's just, I think between you and Steve, you two are just, you're, you're going to save the world with this, uh, this wall <laughs> rope and all of this kelp growing. It's going to be amazing. So we're going to wait now. I can't, I can't wait. I absolutely can't wait. He's going to put his, his, uh, his flippers on and he's going to take us into the sea and we're going to go and see that kelp forest that's been growing secretly. We didn't know it was under there. We had no idea that that's been under there, absorbing all that carbon all this time, help, helping to fight climate change. And I had no idea it was there. So I'm just waiting for uh, to be told whether or not Steve is ready, whether he's in position under the sea so we can go to our, uh, our underwater camera. Um, oh, oh yeah, oh here he is. Oh my goodness, he's under the sea. Okay, hi Steve. I don't know, he probably, you know, I know you can't hear us. Um, <laughs> Oh wow, Kate, can you tell us what, what are we looking at here? Can we see your wool rope? Yeah, so if you look, you see we've got the green blades of the kelp and then in between you've got the white fluffy stuff. That's the, the rope gone back to its original yarn and you can see the fish are all playing with it. Oh wow! And, and so um, you can see that they, they're happy. They've, they've populated that within days of Steve putting that down there. Amazing. And so he's created a, a habitat. And the, the beautiful thing oh, about... Oh, 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 no, we've just lost signal. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, okay, he's back, back now. Great. Perfect. And um, you can see the wrasse there lying in the blade. But the beautiful thing about the wool rope is that if you were using plastic rope, yeah. when the, the seaweed had attached to the bottom with a hold fast, you'd have to then go back down and retrieve that plastic rope. Yes, yeah, because you don't and, want to leave the pollution, yeah. you don't want to leave the litter and down. That's and then that would destruct the, the destroy some of the habitat and mm. scare the wildlife. Whereas that wall, we know it will degrade and we yeah. will know that it won't be an issue. Uh -huh. And so it can be left there. It can just be left there and it'll just... Uh, it'll we just, can leave it alone. Wow, absolutely amazing. Oh, 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 it's turned off. That's absolutely amazing. I'm so glad that we got to see that into the sea. I hope you enjoyed that as well, everybody. So what we're going to do now is we are going to bring back our other speakers. We're going to bring back Susie and Emma. But if you have any questions for them, um, before they join our panel, you've got an opportunity now to pop them into the slide out and we'll ask as many as we can. So off you go, we'll be back in one minute.
Okay, welcome back everybody. We have got our speakers, we've got our panel here in the Wool studio. So I'm getting your questions sent straight through to my phone, so do keep them coming in. Um, we're going to kick off with, uh, from St. Vincent's, what is used to dye wool? So Emma, I'm going to give that one to you. Okay, well traditionally we used um, plants mm -hmm. um, to dye wool, so that could be oak leaves or um, marigolds or madder, which is a root. Okay. Um, we actually use uh, chemical dyes because all of the natural dyes, although they're very beautiful, they are affected by sunlight mm -hmm. and also when we're washing them. Um, so they start to fade. Mm. So it's really important when somebody's making a jumper, you don't want it to start fading from colour. Yeah. So we use um, chemical dyes. Okay. But in, in, in the past, it would have been um, yes. natural things. Okay. Um, and so the next question I'm going to give to Susie from George Washington Primary School. Why is wool better than cotton? Um, well, in the, the process of growing cotton, an awful lot of water is used. So mm. if you imagined the, the big Coke bottles that you get, you'd need a thousand of those <gasps> filled with water to make enough cotton to make one T-shirt. Just one T-shirt? Yeah, and oh, although wow. we use a lot of water in the washing process for the wool, it's recycled and then at the end of that, because it's got all the dirt and grease out of the wool, that then is used to go back on the field. So it's, it's all sort of used throughout. And um, yeah, so the, the main thing is that producing wool does not use as much water. Right, okay. So it's better for the planet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't, definitely didn't know that. That's just another amazing thing about wool. Um, so uh, let's have a look. Uh, can mattresses be made from wool? This is from Rudy. Right, yeah, I'll take that one. So um, as you can see in the forefront, we've got um, a mattress there. So that is made with wool. Um, but also you can get duvets and pillows. And we've, we've learned all about the, the amazing properties of wool, about um, the, the helping regulate your heat. So when you're asleep at night, your, your body temperature changes and depending on your age. Mm. And, and so um, that's why sleeping on a wool mattress or a duvet, it helps regulate your heat at night. Oh, right. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to give this one to Susie. How much wool would come from one sheep? This is from Olivia from Thomas Bullock uh, Primary School. Well, Olivia, it depends on the breed of sheep. So some of them um, would grow a lot more wool than others, but in the UK, we'd be going from the, the worst, sort of the lightest ones would be sort of half a kilo to a kilo, right up to probably around six kilos for a, a Romney breed, which mm. carries a lot of wool. Um, obviously, some of the merinos that you get in the Southern Hemisphere, they would, they're higher clip weight than that as well so even fluffier yeah so probably on average about sort of three and a half four kilos how much you know uh, florence this morning how much yes. do you reckon that was yeah so she, that was i would say that's probably four to five kilos of yeah. her she was very she was yeah very she had a lot of fleece on her <laughs> so uh riley's asking can male sheep be dangerous who wants to take that one okay oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yes they can yeah. They can be um, quite large mm. and very, um, very strong. Um, we had one ram that cleared a five bar gate, just wow. jumped it straight over. Oh so goodness. it's really important for our flock to make sure that um, we have nice tempered yes. animals. Mm. Um, and some of them can be quite aggressive, which is um, always important not to just go into a field of sheep mm. thinking yeah. that... They're fluffy. Yeah, they're not all going to be like Florence. No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> no. Um, okay, so we've got uh, Year 5 at St. Peter's C of E Academy are asking, are sheep smarter than a 10-year-old child? Who would like to take <laughs> that one? I'll take that one. I would say it probably depends on the child and depends on the sheep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, so I'll put that one back to you. <laughs> That's a very, very good, quite a good answer. So, um, what, so who have we got here? We've got Devonshire Park in Birkenhead. Thank you for your question. They've said, why is seaweed green and could we ever have green sheep? Who wants that one? Um, well, we, we have um, different seaweeds. So we have brown seaweed, mm -hmm. green seaweed and red. So it depends on the species. Mm -hmm. um, but it is true that um, if sheep graze seaweed, it, the, the, the meat will taste salty. It does affect, so really? um, it will um, affect them. So it won't turn them green. 
It won't turn green. Not on the outside. No. Oh. But, but uh, it will yeah. affect the, the, the... Yeah, it will definitely... Well, everything we eat affects mm. you know, what the meat we have at the end. Yeah, okay. I didn't know that either. So, uh, how long does it take for a sheep to regrow their fleece? Susie, do you want that one? Yeah, I'll take that. So, um, they start growing it immediately. Yeah. And they'll grow it quite quickly, especially if they're, they're warm when they're shorn. So, you, if they're cold when you shear them, they'll lay down fat quite quickly to keep them warm. Oh, right. And otherwise, if they're nice, at nice warm temperature, so when we're shearing them in the UK, it's sort of in the summertime when it's warmer weather, they'll quickly grow that fleece. So within um, a week, you would probably have half an inch wow, that quick. So really but, and then it does st steady up, but that initial growth is quite quick. Yeah. But obviously it takes uh, one year to get the full amount of fleece. Yes, that we saw this morning, yes. the full yeah, floor. Yeah, that's a year. Um, so, Kate, how strong is the wool rope? Okay, so um, it's not as strong as plastic rope, so we have to make sure that we, we, we do an engineering test of where we use it. But if you, so for this rope, if you took an average child of about, or a person about 30 kilos, it would need 30 people to get to the point where it would probably break. So sort 30 of a, people? So sort of classroom size. Oh my goodness, so a whole class. And mm -hmm. we could, wow, oh my goodness, let's not try that today. Um, <laughs> but it's nice to know that it's, it's yeah, really somewhere strong. Somewhere near there, yeah. Wow. Um, this one's for you, Emma. So uh, how long does it take to go from a sheep to yarn? So um, as Susie said, it takes a year to grow the fleece. Mm -hmm. And then it has to go away for washing yep. and come back. So that's about another three months. Mm -hmm. And then the processing probably takes a couple of weeks by the time we've produced, um, got it ready for spinning. Yeah. And then it needs to be um, wound mm -hmm. and dyed. So we're probably looking overall about 14 months, wow. 15 months. So to, it's, a, it's a long process. It's a long process. Mm. But it's so worth it after everything we've learned today. Yeah. Okay, so how long does the wool last under the sea and what happens to it, Kate? Can you just explain a bit about that? Yeah, so we, we don't know. Actually, I'm doing research in that. That's what my PhD is in. So we're, we're learning all the time because the more we know, the more then we can use it. And seaweed, I'm working with seaweed farmers in Scotland and they're redesigning their farm so that they can use the rope. Wow. So, um, but... Uh, one other thing that's really good is that if we use seaweed for like bioethanol boilers or for fertilizer, the rope can go with it. So we, it actually serves a purpose with the seaweed. Um, so it's not necessarily do we leave it there and let it degrade. Mm. You know, it's, it keeps having afterlife after the seaweed farm. So it's just really, really useful. Like, yeah. yeah. So I think we're going to say, I do think everybody that we have seen a sneak preview of a brand new product that is going to be everywhere soon. I think this is really exciting. Um, so we've got a question. So um, year two at Bratton Primary School, what inspired you to do your job? I think we should ask everybody this one. So um, who wants to go first? Okay, go this way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I grew up in a small um, farming village in South Wales, and all I ever wanted to do was have my own farm. Mm -hmm. And when we bought the farm, it was all crops, and we wanted to get back um, to having some animals on the farm because obviously that brings di biodiversity and bird life and everything else. Yeah. So the main thing about getting the sheep was being able to do something with the, the sheep's wool that allowed us to keep farming mm. and um, improve the, the land. Mm. Yeah, and you, you do so much with the wool, don't you? Like, this is so, also <laughs> yes. very exciting, this, this uh, place that we're in here, um, at the, the Grey uh, Sheep Company. Um, Kate, what was your uh, answer? Um, well, I mean, I'm fourth generation sheep farming, so I guess it, it's in my blood. Yeah. But the, the, the real driver for the rope and everything is that we... We, the farmer doesn't actually get a very good return for their wool. They mm -hmm. get the least amount of money throughout the whole process. And, um, you know, they, they need that income to keep their farms going. And, mm. you know, I just really believe in what British sheep farmers do. You know, I know how hard they work. Yeah. And they definitely deserve a, a better return. So that's, that's the mission, really. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, and I was brought up on a very small farm, so we were surrounded by animals from a young age and then uh, got introduced to sheep, sort of around about nine years old. And just a passion for being outside in the countryside, caring and looking after animals. And I just 
you know, encourage any children that are watching today, if you think farming is something for you, I mean, it's a hard work, but an amazing job. And especially with the sheep, it's so rewarding. And mm. you don't have to be a farmer to get into farming. So it's, some, it's an avenue you could look into going down. Mm. There's just so many roles in, uh, in farming, aren't there? Oh, incredible, you yeah, be, yeah. yeah. You don't have to be a farmer, absolutely. Um, so that's all we've got time for today. We've had such an action-packed morning. Uh, it's been very exciting. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. If you want to continue learning about wool, there are some resources. If you scroll down, teachers, to the bottom of the page, the, the lesson page, you will see our wool investigation resources that you can download and have a look at. And we're also so as part of our um, email that we send out to everyone who's joined today, we're going to be sending you out some links because we know that you're slightly older children so that you, you can do some of your, so your own independent research because we haven't been able to, we've only really scratched the surface of some of these exciting projects involving wool that we wanted to talk about today. So if you want, if you're interested in any of the things we've talked about, we are going to be sending you out some more information if you want to read those for yourselves. But thank you very much to, for everyone for joining us. Thank you to our speakers. And I will see you again. If you join again tomorrow, we're here again at 11 o'clock with Flavian, the pig farmer, and his pig dog, Rex. So I might see some of you then. Um, uh, it's bye for now. <laughs>